Welcome to Beyond the Press Release, a production of GoreCom, in which we take the time to speak with small cap executives right after they put out important news. And today, we've got two executives on for the first time from Mountain Valley MD. We got Dennis Hancock, President CEO. We got Mike Farber, Director of Life Sciences. The company trades on the CSC and the stock symbol MVMD. Now, for those of you new to the story, and that's going to be a lot of you, let me explain first what this company does, and we're going to get into today's press release. MVMD takes existing vaccines and drugs and delivers them better, both into the body and by transportation to the world. In fact, way better. So for purposes of this introduction to the company, let's use vaccines as an example, because given what's happened the last 12, 13 months, we've all heard more about vaccines in 12 months than we probably have in the last 12 years. One thing we all know, vaccines uh, are the safest way to protect people against infectious diseases. We've all known that. But one thing we don't know, and I didn't realize this because they just took it for granted. Uh, we don't know or understand about vaccinations that they're only as good as the global physical delivery system. That's the system, that's the delivery that gets from the manufacturer to your arm, okay? And the second one is the delivery system into your body, all right? I, for example, needles, injections, but not with, not with MVMD. That's what we're going to be talking about today. If either of those parts of the delivery system are weak or they fail, the vaccines either lose, uh, lose potency, some or all, and that's not good for anybody. That's where MVMD comes in. Uh, they don't make the vaccines, the drugs, the pharmaceuticals, but what they do is make their delivery better. Uh, and that's very good for everybody. By doing so, they help save lives and they help manufacturers, their customers become more profitable. And that's great for humanity and all shareholders. Guys, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Thanks, George. Nice to see you. Hey, we're glad to have you on for the first time. You guys are doing amazing things. Uh, big press release today. Very technical, so that's why we've got you on here because you guys have, uh, there's a couple of quotes I'm going to refer to, but the headline is Mountain Valley MD files patent for novel vaccine dose sparing adjuvant. Uh, there's a lot in that headline. So first, what are adjuvants and what is dose sparing? Just so that everyone at home kind of know what we're talking about here. Okay, adjuvants are substances that are used to increase the immune response to the vaccine. So a lot of vaccines, you won't get a huge immune response. So what you do is you add a molecule to it and it boosts your immune system and gives you a better immune reaction to the vaccine. So these have been around uh, for about a hundred years. Aluminum is the most accepted adjuvant in the world. It's considered the gold standard of adjuvants. And what we've done is we've taken it and we've just made it quantumly better. Yeah, and I never thought aluminum would have been an adjuvant at the end of the day. When I read that in the press, we said, am I reading that wrong? Or is that, or is that another kind of, uh, you know, formula that I don't know about? And dose sparing, guys. Uh, what is dose sparing? Yeah, that's a, that's a great one in the sense of the simplicity. Imagine taking a single dose of a vaccine and stretching it across 20 doses. That's dose sparing. All right. That's simple enough to understand, but unless we knew what the, what those things were, it'd be difficult to really understand this press release. So I'm going to start off here with a quote from Mike, because uh, it's, 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 it's a pretty big quote, and I'm going to read it. It is a reasonable scientific objective that our new dose-sparing adjuvant will enable us to deliver inactivated polio vaccine with the same effect as a full standard dose that is used today but using about 20 times less of a vaccine, of the vaccine. This is a critical achievement to optimize manufacturing and dramatically reduce cost. Mike, that's one big claim there, right? I mean- I know it sounds like a big claim, but there's a lot of research out there that even before we came along with our advanced adjuvant from aluminum, aluminum adjuvants had been tested in polio, polio vaccines and proven to be dose sparing up to 10 times. The real problem is that none of these adjuvants can be commercially used with polio vaccine. So you have something that has scientific promise, but you can't get it to be commercially used. We've bridged that gap with our discovery. So now what happens is we can apply <laughs> aluminum adjuvants in our form to dose reducing uh, polio vaccines. 
So we've basically not done the, the foundational science. What we've done is improved on the science that's right. already out there that proves that this is feasible. Within the industry, when you put out something like, when you, when you make a statement like that and put out news like this, um, how big is that so we can get an understanding uh, of relevance, the relevance here and, and context? How big of an achievement is this? Yeah, so I think it's really significant. And that question is interesting because it can be answered a couple of ways. The one is, um, what is the broad application? So if you start to answer that question, just saying taking a single dose of something that if it costs you $100 or a dollar, now you can stretch that. So just the manufacturing alone has massive implications. If you take a you know, multi-billion dollar vaccine market, you've just enabled you know, profitability, cost reduction, uh, production capacity increase in, in uh, rare uh, vaccines that aren't available. Yeah, you've completely upended the model almost, right? Yeah, exactly. And there are shortages that exist in the market. If, for example, IPV, inactivated polio vaccine, there's a shortage in the market. It would take three to five years to even bring up manufacturing capacity at hundreds of millions of dollars of cost to do what we've done with just a simple modification of the adjuvant. So it's value in terms of how it can affect the producers, the major producers of even polio is tremendous. You have cost savings in hundreds of millions of dollars. You have the ability to reach the whole world's population now with a uh, capacity that's current. Mm -hmm. So it, it really goes to helping with the, the objective of global polio eradic eradication. And to get people to understand, you know, I, again, but before I met you guys, you know, I got my polio vaccine at school when I was a kid, all good. I just assumed that's the way it was around the world, right? But what happens in North America and developed countries is much different what's happening in developing countries. If you could just give people an understanding of why polio, polio has been eradicated around the world. It's not for want of trying, but there's just a couple of fundamental problems that MVMD is actually attacking. It looks like it can solve. Yeah, I can start on a on the introduction of our cold chain work. So today we're talking about, you know, the dose sparing, which is a critical part of our strategy, but there's three prongs to what we're doing in this space. The second piece is what you're alluding to is the complexity of global distribution. We're seeing cold chain a lot right now in the news because of, you know, extreme temperature requirements requirements with COVID vaccine and such. But cold chain really simply is just a two to eight degree band that 90% of the drugs and vaccines in the world are produced, shipped and administered under this tight control band. As you start to go to third world countries, 90% of them don't have the electricity infrastructure. And I've seen reports that we're talking about a $50 billion problem when you start to add logistical costs for cold chain and just the wastage of vaccines globally. So Mike brought up the point, you can't produce enough. And then the sadder part is when it finally gets where it's needed, 35 billion of that 50 is in wasted vaccine. And so that, you know, Unbelievable. It's pretty exciting, yeah. And I'm gonna quote you now, Dennis, because you make an even bigger statement here. Um, and it's fantastic. First of all, it's fantastic for humanity. And then second of all, it's great for shareholders. So there's a, you know, one of those rare situations where it's a double bonus. You said using a fraction of the inactivated polio vaccine, applying advanced Quixum, that's your product, uh, thin film, uh, thin film inside a vial that can be distributed completely outside of the cold chain, which means you don't have to rely on the whole, what you're talking about, the uh, lack of infrastructure and refrigeration and administering through needless applications is the formula to help us achieve our vision of a world without polio. I mean, that's a huge statement. And I know you don't say it lightly and you're not some stock promoter, right? Um, yeah. No, in how fact, far away are you, are you guys a company from, do you think maybe achieving this, this, this vision? Well, let me, let me, just before Mike responds to the technical side, let me just make sure because you, yeah, you're bringing up the three lanes and how they work together. So in the simplest form, you take, you know, take a vaccine, find a unique technique to use less of it. So 1 20th. And then you're right, you bring up our Quixome technology, which we do through rapid dissolve oral um, technologies that 
dissolve, you know, and cross the mucosa uh, orally. Now we, we, you know, we can print that in, you know, wafers, thin film, powders, uh, through our desiccated liposome technique. Now we take less of a vaccine, we lay it in the same way we would, and instead of printing it on a thin strip, we're printing it inside a vial. Um, we have a couple techniques that I'll let Mike describe, you know, that'll wow. link to Nebulous, and then deliver that outside of cold chain. We actually are fast tracking cold chain testing right now with the FDA uh, polio lab. Uh, that uh, project you're going to hear some exciting things in the next couple of weeks on. And we're testing, frankly, right up to 45 degrees Celsius. So five degree increments from, you know, 25 degrees right up. And we will, we believe, have something unprecedented on Earth. And then I'd love Mike to sort of build on this to describe how that impacts our third lane, which is how does it get administered, you know, locally. So outside of cold chain. Right. So basically the, the technology, one technology builds on the other, but they run concurrently. So the, the current uh, release about our adjuvant is able to be implemented immediately by manufacturers using aluminum adjuvants and who can't use aluminum adjuvants now. So mm -hmm. that's one thing, but it, it's able to be combined with our vision of how do we approach getting polio into the hands of the world outside of cold chain and to do it effectively, cost effectively and administer it effectively. So once you reduce a dose, now you're able to dry that dose much faster, much easier. So now we're able to embed it inside of let's say a small vial or even a small cartridge. And that cartridge can now be used with a spring loaded intradermal injector. So now we're talking, taking 1 20th of the dose putting it and drawing it into a small cartridge, which is then introduced into the body needlessly intradermally so that you get the three major effects. Mm -hmm. One is you get no cold chain, you get uh, dose sparing, but you also get the third most important part of what we want to achieve with uh, polio, which is mucosal immunity. So if we are able to achieve all these things through our approach, we're basically the holy grail of what everybody has sought for the last 50 years with polio, which is a cost-effective way of distributing polio vaccine worldwide to countries that, can know, that really can't get it and that you can inject it easily without using a needle. So this is the real goal of what, what our technologies are all geared around. And then we used polio as a proxy for mm -hmm. all of the other vaccines that yeah. we're not gonna turn our attention to. But polio has a certain how can I say, attraction to me personally. My father suffered from polio. So it was basically the first mountain that we wanted to climb. Where I think we're very close to putting together this achievement. And as Dennis said, over the next few weeks, we'll have uh, press releases that tell you how we're progressing in, in this goal. Guys, it's almost uh, as, as, look, I've been around this business for 23 years, had hundreds of clients, watched tens of thousands of companies. And it's not very often where I'm, I'm not going to say I'm speechless, but where I'm left in awe and what you guys are saying uh, is, is awe inspiring. That's it's, it's almost hard to imagine, not hard to believe because I, I know you guys are being truthful, but man, it's hard to imagine that a, a small cap company, uh, you know, can be so nimble, so smart and have great technology to solve a problem that the world's biggest pharmaceutical companies haven't, haven't been able to, to solve. And that's, that's great. Small picture, big, small, a small picture, big picture. Mike, I want to ask you, you said something about you can inject, it's injectable without a needle. If you can, just give us an idea of what that means. Cause uh, there are companies that have already in production, what are called needleless spring based needleless injectors. They look like, let's say a, uh, something that you hold in your hand, you just pop it against your skin. It pushes okay. a small jet of water that's finer than the uh, a hair. And this is at a pressure that allows this fine jet of water to enter through the skin and go to a specific depth, which is we call in intradermal. That means it's between 80 to 100 <laughs> microns in depth. And that's where you get the optimal effect on mucosal immunity. So what we're hoping is that the combination of everything that we're putting together will give us not only the dose sparing, not only the ability to get this around the world without cold chain, but will also give us a first in terms of polio vaccine of IPV being able to induce a mucosal immunity.
So it's yeah, because because I mean, needles around the world are inconsistent, right? It just all depends on who the person is that's giving you the needle. Did they put it in the right place? Too high, too low, too deep. Whereas this just gives you the perfect in in injection without using a needle. I love it, man. Yeah. Uh, Dennis, let's talk business. How do you turn this uh, into a business? I know it is a business, but for everyone at home, uh, do you license it? Do you manufacture these vials yourselves? Uh, for everyone at home who doesn't know and is listening to, and listen to this for the first time, what's the business model look like if all goes well? Yeah, it's an awesome question. And it's a great sort of segue to the tee up about, wow, like how is all this possible and how are you guys yeah. moving fast? And I'd start by answering that saying, you know, our original scale of the business was imagining a full on licensing model, working with world class, you know, pharmaceutical vaccine sure. partners who can move fast scale, understand the regulatory market. So we stay very narrow on our focus and on, you know, even here behind us, people have asked, what is that behind you? That's our formulation lab, you know, where it's all a GMP controlled uh, facility where a lot of our work's done. And the stuff that comes out of here is designed by molecule. And so each of our partners has different business lanes, different objectives. And so our ability to scale by, you know, serving them up something that makes their particular molecule better. Today, we're talking about the polio vaccine as one, but you know, we're doing work in insulin, we're doing work on you know, cannabinoids, we're doing work down a, you know, a stream of nutraceuticals, et cetera. So we're able to do, um, take the best of what our partner's capabilities are, serve them up a new skill technique, teach them to fish, if you will, and then help them. However, um, I have to say, if, I, if you ask me, what was I most surprised about, about some of the, uh, these world-class partners we're dealing with, they move slow. Um, I've grown up in a business development. I work in minutes. I think Mike will attest to the pressure that we, we put ourselves under yeah, as change makers. Sure. We are so motivated. The hours we put in, the effort we put in is on a scale I don't think pharma is even imagining. Again, they're frantic on COVID doing their best work. I think as fast as they're going, we're going faster. So how do you overcome? Because look, the, every company has its challenges. I don't, I don't care if you're Google. I don't care if you're Coca-Cola. Yeah. Every company has its challenges. Is that the, simultaneously the massive upside, but at the same time, the challenge for you, which is your partners have been doing business this way for 50 years, you know, needles, the sale, the, the vaccine, transport it, needles, and that's, is it, is that the challenge? And how big of a challenge is it? Like, what kind of feedback are you, are you hearing the feedback, Dennis, that's, man, we've been doing business like this for so long, we got to turn this whole ship around, but we're going to get there? Or is there resistance to it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Perhaps the best example that I can think of without getting into some non-disclosure stuff. Um, we had one, you know, the, the project that Mike just described on polio, for example, we're in fairly advanced conversations on that with an end partner in mind. And those discussions, um, you know, to remind your audience, we also, this, these oral thin strips and some of those wafers, they also have a lane outside of cold chain and easy administration. A lot of the work we're doing with ivermectin right now. Um, you know, we've achieved some incredible preclinical results on, for example, we did learn um, the precision of dosing with a needle mindset was probably a good example to that question of something that surprised me because there's a medical certainty of that precision. And so taking something orally across the mucosa, you know, we've seen in our own research has about a 5% variability versus 40% for other oral drugs. Um, and, and that's sublingual for everyone at home, right? Under the tongue, a correct, thin film correct. strip under the tongue. But whereas an intramuscular is 0% variability. And that is the, that makes a lot of sense. If someone's being rushed into the hospital, they'd rather put you on an IV drip and inject you uh, than they would give you something orally, just common sense. So that would be my one answer to that. What surprised me most, but not an indication that they wouldn't embrace new technologies. I think there's a very strong, innovative culture. Um, a lot of these big uh, pharmaceutical partners, they would spend $15 billion a year in R&D. The smallest ones spend 5 billion. And so they're innovative, they're pushing hard. Um, again, where we intersect is speed um, and innovation. I'd and say. just 
just add another point, George. Sure. As we pointed out earlier, the adjuvant can be adopted right now into current vaccine technology mm. and current vaccine manufacturing. So it is a licensed capability that we currently hold immediately. Right, it's right. It's an advantage, it's a step forward, it's a, almost like a next generation of aluminum adjuvant. So this could be adopted readily by a large number of companies already manufacturing vaccines. So there's a short, there's, a, there's, there's an immediate term uh, commercialization Right. Uh, and then there's the longer term commercialization when we get outside of the cold chain and needles and all that, that takes a little longer. So that's great to hear. So you've got, you've got, re you've got commercialization potential in, in stages. Right. And none of it is, uh, that's another good segue to the timeline for pharmaceutical partners to bring something to market. You rightfully said in your intro that we're taking existing world-class drug and vaccines that have already proven themselves. And so we're not inventing new drugs. You know, if you start to understand the pharma lane, you know, they might have, you know, file a patent and then do all the product development, the trials, everything to bring it to market and maybe have a three year uh, of, of a 20 year patent left for exclusivity in the marketplace. So we take all of their best work and give them a 20 year uh, extension of their patents. No way. That's how it works because they've what? Because they've improved the patent. Well, they get yeah, they would take our applied patent technology right, right. and go head, head to head in the generic market space with a new differentiated product offering. So that's why, you know, having lots of partners moving fast in their own lanes and their own expertise is exciting for us. And the revenues, like, you know, I didn't answer your question directly, but what I was intimating at, the problems we're solving are tens of billions of dollars. Yeah, the, the catalyst is like, there. Does this company the, make money? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's lots of money to be made, not, not naively. There's effort, there's work. A lot of the science has to, you know, finish its uh, cycles that we're working on, but they're massive problems and a lot of people are interested. In and correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking on the fly here. The other catalyst, so obviously the first catalyst for a partner is holy moly, efficiency, dollars, and they see that. I, am I right to assume that another catalyst is going to come from the social side, which is as the world and the developing world and NGO organizations like the World Health Organization find out about this, they're going to come with their own pressure because they don't care about profits. They care about we need to save lives. We need to make lives better. So I would assume that your partners, your potential customers, your target market are going to feel it from both sides. They're going to have the bean counter saying, we can make more money and they're going to have the, you know, the, the world, the world on top of them saying mm -hmm. we need to save more people get to it as fast as possible. Am I, is that a wrong assumption? Well, no, I think it's a perfect assumption and it, and it sort of segues to the culture here. Like what gets us out of bed? Um, I've said this many times, uh, we're building a company that's changing the world. We're not building a share price. And um, I think the share price wow. will follow itself and, you know, Mike alluded to the, his his personal pursuit with his father's, you know, polio. I mean, it's a really cool thing when you look at, you know, how transformational the work we can do. And we haven't even talked about husbandry animals and companion animals. But yeah, a lot we'll save of those. Yeah, we'll save because that that's a whole other. But so the markets, the markets, massive. Yeah. Mike, for you, how getting a little personal, but. How does it feel knowing that you're getting closer and closer to solving a problem that obviously deeply impacts? And it's amazing how many great scientists and doctors are born from health challenges in their families when they're younger. Man, how does it feel knowing that you're on the cusp of making sure that no family in the future goes ever goes through that again? Honestly, it's a great feeling because I know how it impacted my father. So it impacted him negatively for his whole life. The great thing, the other great thing is being able to work with world-class scientists like we do at the FDA. And a very strange, uh, this is another very interesting story is Dr. Chumakov's parents worked on the polio vaccine out of Russia during the scourge of the fifties when it was prevalent across Russia. So his parents were deeply involved in bringing OPV into Russia and proving it. So, you know, this is almost like a wow. somehow like a fate that we've gotten to work together mm -hmm. on, on solving this problem. 
What do you need to do next, Mike, from the science point of view? What's left that uh, do you have to go for everyone at home? Do you have to go through any trials or do you have to go through any testing or, or is it just shipping samples to your partners so they can do okay. their so, testing to confirm all this? That's a great question. So we're in the next couple of weeks, we're doing final testing for cold chain uh, at the FDA labs that will uh, hopefully confirm that we can put this into the vials outside of cold chain completely. Then we'll combine it with what we already know we have in the adjuvant. And then that goes off for testing in uh, mouse trials. Hopefully that will be, uh, at that point, we'll be in, in deep discussion and hopefully a handshake type of deal with a large uh, pharma partner. So I think we're really on the cusp of breaking out and really proving to the world that this is a real possibility right now very 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 soon mike hats off to you man on you know full on on fulfilling uh your legacy based on your dad and 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 uh, honoring his legacy and memory i think but look we all want to make some money and that's great i'm and i'm i'm sure you're the same way i'm two-thirds driven by revenue you got to feed the little ones right a one-third driven by legacy which is bigger man i'm i'm this is the first this is the first time we've really spoken well second-ish but man, I'm, I'm super proud of you to hear this. It's, it's just phenomenal to hear, man. It's a, honestly, this is a team effort. And I, I know that. Made it all the, yeah. You know, it's not possible without the help of all the people at Mountain Valley and the help of the people at the FDA who really have, have uh, based on what I've explained to them, they've signed on to this. They believe in what we're doing. They believe in the scientific basis of what they're, we're doing. Mm -hmm. And they've been unbelievably helpful in helping uh, us achieve this this milestone. Congrats. And Dennis, congratulations to you. Cause look, we know that someone, you know, we know the present CEO has to keep the business side running, right? You can't change the world. What's that famous saying? You can't change the world if you can't pay the rent. So, mm -hmm. you know, congratulations on what you guys have achieved from the business side, whatever you've done to get the company to this moment, to finance it, to bring in the right people, to orchestrate it all. Uh, this is one of the most powerful interviews we've done in, in years. Uh, it's a, This has been amazing, man. Congratulations to both you guys. Thank you. Appreciate it's an honor it. to do this work. Uh, I'm going to leave last word to you, Dennis, before we sign off. Just to, you know, what do you want your shareholders to know for the next two, three months? Or, you know, what do you, what do you want to sign off with until, until you're back again, which is going to happen a lot? Yeah, well, I mean, our shareholders are why we're here. They have been the reason we've been able to finance um, I, a genuine thank you for believing, you know, this company's pivoted and transitioned, uh, very significantly. And, uh, I think everyone's now seeing, you know, just how hard that work is paying off. And I would just say, continue to believe and, uh, and thanks for joining where nothing we're doing is short of, you know, with the aspiration of changing the world and health and wellness and, and we can't do it without their support. Good stuff, guys. Good stuff. Congratulations. Thanks for being here. I know your days are busy, but doing this to talk to the shareholders, to talk to new investors, to get them. There's no way this transcended in today's press release, right? With This is where it all comes out, and, and I'm thrilled for you guys. Thanks awesome. again. Thanks, George. You've been watching or you've been listening by podcast on your favorite podcast platform, Spotify, Google, Apple, to Dennis Hancock, President CEO, Mike Farber, Director of Lights, Life Sciences over at Mountain Valley MD, trades on the CSC and the stock symbol MVMD. You've heard what they say, what they've had to say. You've watched it. You got to do your due diligence now. I love what I heard. We know that companies like MVMD uh, have a double edged sword. On the one hand, new cutting edge breakthrough technology that can change the world. That's great. But we also know for you at home, sometimes it's difficult to understand because when you're going into uncharted territory, you know, this isn't widgets that we're talking about here. So we know you got to do your due diligence. Get to Agoracom, look up the company's name or stock symbol and get to the profile page where we've really neatly laid out the company in layman's terms. You heard my intro. We kind of carry that right through so you can really understand what the company is doing. And then get over to the company's website also. Take a look around there. You definitely got to look there, do your due diligence. And uh, like Dennis says, just keep following, keep watching, and uh, don't say we didn't tell you so. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Have a great day. See you next time.